Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here to listen to my presentation. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Patrick Miller. I'm a fourth year medical student at Washington State University. I'm joining you guys for a one month elective rotation in spine surgery. So uh, thank you all for allowing me to join you. Today I'll be giving a presentation on post-operative C5 palsy in cervical spine surgery. And I'll be using a case presentation to guide a review of the literature on this topic. I'll try to go quickly through the case so we can get to some of the review. Um, the patient is a 25-year-old male who came into the emergency department with neck pain after he dove into a shallow pool. The patient was able to ambulate following the injury. Uh, he was in a collar upon arrival to the emergency department. He was having no numbness, no tingling. He denied any urinary or fecal incontinence. He had uh, no past medical history and was generally healthy. His only surgical history was a prior ACL repair surgery. No prior back surgeries or, or neck surgeries. Physical examination done in the emergency department revealed uh, midline neck tenderness at the mid-cervical region. Uh, no other abnormalities. He was neurologically intact throughout. Uh, so this is a cervical spine CT scan done in the emergency department. Uh, unfortunately, this doesn't indica indicate right versus left. Um, so I do have some still images as well. I'll let this loop one more time. As you can see on, on this slide, uh, the patient did have a right C5 perched facet circled in yellow. There was no left perch fa perched facet. Additionally, uh, and pretty interestingly, this patient had uh, likely congenital fusion of C6 and C7. Um, so uh, that's circled here in yellow. Uh, he also had a fracture through the uh, C6 segment uh, at that fusion. This patient's operative plan was anterior C5-6 discectomy, open reduction internal fixation with C5 to C7 fusion. And I've included the intraoperative fluoroscopy images here, an AP and a lateral there. The procedure was without complication. The patient's post-operative course, uh, on post-operative day one, he did complain of right arm weakness specifically dif difficulty with abduction of the arm. Physical examination demonstrated three out of five strength in the right deltoid. Uh, elsewhere, the strength was five out of five and symmetric. He had no sensory deficits. He had no cerebellar deficits. His reflexes were non-pathologic throughout. A repeat CT scan of the cervical spine was obtained. Um, this is a video. And so as you can see from uh, the repeat CT scan, the patient did have a persistent right perched facet. Additionally, on the coronal view there on the right, you can see that the, some of the inferior uh, hardware placement screws uh, were placed through the fracture, uh, and that actually widened the transverse fracture there. I also have a still image of that on the next slide. You can see there the widened fracture pattern. So this patient is uh, given the unstable fracture pattern, uh, the uh, persistent right C5 perched facet. He is scheduled for uh, posterior fixation surgery today, which is post-operative day three. As of yesterday, his deltoid weakness was improving. Uh, on post-operative day one, his motor strength was three out of five, and yesterday it was four out of five. So C5 palsy uh, is a common complication of cervical spine surgery. It complicates roughly 6% of cervical spine surgeries. The literature is fairly heterogen, uh, heterogeneous regarding uh, possible risk factors. But those include posterior surgeries in which it's more common, as well as a number of other risk factors listed here on the screen. There is some inconsistency in the literature, though, regarding 
uh, these risk factors. The pathogenesis is not clear. There is no proven cause to date, but there are a number of, of hypotheses, and in all likelihood, it is multifactorial. Uh, the hypotheses range from direct traumatic injury to the, of the nerve root uh, to ischemic uh, changes and ischemic damage. The two leading hypotheses that I found in my literature review were uh, mechanical, rela mechanically related, so specifically traction of that C5 nerve root uh, versus reperfusion injury. Clinical presentation and diagnosis of C5 palsy. The classic presentation is isolated weakness of the deltoid, uh, possibly with involvement of the biceps muscle as well. Uh, most traditionally, there is no sensory involvement. Um, the important thing here is to distinguish it from other uh, causes of weakness that could occur postoperatively. Parsonage Turner syndrome is a superior brachial plexus injury that can also occur. And so the distinguishing factor there is going to be sensory involvement and involvement of the rotator cuff. Uh, which is more common with Parsonage-Turner syndrome. Overall, the diagnosis of C5 palsy is a clinical one. Treatment, prevention, and prognosis of C5 palsy. Um, the treatment, the, the uh, natural history of this disease is that it typically, especially in mild and moderate cases, resolves spontaneously. And so treatment is primarily focused on uh, just supportive care, uh, as well as prevention. And prevention methods uh, vary. There have been a number that are proposed, including alternate, uh, altering traction techniques during surgery, using cold water irrigation during drilling, um, post-operative patient positioning. These have been vari variably shown to be effective, and that is the focus on, of treatment in this. My take-home message is that C5 palsy is a relatively common complication of cervical spine surgery. It is typically self-limiting, though not always. Uh, preventive measures should be taken during and after the operation. Uh, and another take-home message that's not on this slide I would have is that the literature is uh, fairly variable in um, risk factors, course, even incidents. So I do think that there needs to be more focus on this moving forward with literature. That's what I have for you today. Are there any questions? Great job. Yeah, I don't know. Go ahead. So, Patrick, what was, did you, did you find any papers on um, incidents of going anterior? There were a number of papers that compared anterior versus posterior. Generally, most of the papers I found, including meta-analyses and systematic reviews, found that the Incidence is lower in anterior approaches. Um, numbers that I was seeing was four to five percent incidence versus six to seven percent incidence for posterior. Great, great job, by the way. Yeah, good job. <laughs> Two questions. Sorry, somebody else has a third question. For yes. What do you tell the patients with C five palsy? What I would advise them is that. Uh, for patients with mild to moderate symptoms, the resolution rate is 95%. Typical duration of symptoms is six months, um, although it can persist for longer than that. For severe symptoms, the resolution rate is uh, closer to 70%. So it would depend a little bit on how severe the patient's deltoid weakness is. Yes, I think the take point is Over, over what time period should they get better? Uh, six months is kind of a typical time period, but it can take up to a year. So you mentioned three clinical syndromes in a great slide. Maybe you can go back to that. Sure. Parsonage Turner mm -hmm. as a nerve injury and uh, other causes. So give us a very brief nutshell. What separates Parsonage Turner from axillary nerve injury? Mm -hmm. So uh, Parsonage-Turner is an un uh, a syndrome of unclear cause, likely uh, autoimmune, that affects uh, rotator cuff muscles. Uh, it's, it's, it affects the superior brachial plexus, most typically presenting uh, with weakness of the rotator cuff, can include deltoid, and often has sensory deficits. 
Axillary nerve injury often follows um, shoulder injury, such as dislocation, and uh, most often presents with sensory deficits as well. Where would that sensory deficit be? Uh, axillary nerve. Um, Show us on your arm. Like. Over the deltoid. Yeah, over the sensory deltoid. Floor. Yeah. So Parsons Turner, very painful, and then we got C5, C6, uh, radiculopathy. So this herniation is a big thing, but what is the Parsons Turner syndrome? What is that actually? Uh, my understanding is that its pathogenesis is not super clear, but that it's essentially inflammatory, uh, an inflammatory process affecting the superior brachial plexus. It's an inflammation of the brachial plexus, probably from a viral etiology. Very painful. So these are all very different. The first thing is painful. The second thing has a numbness to it. And uh, rotated cuff pathology is a mechanical pain without any of these other things, but can have weakness. Frozen shoulder is another thing that's frequently mm. missed. That's a calcific tendonitis of the superior rotator cuff. Okay. Okay. So good job. Yeah, great job, Patrick. So this is this thing right there. All of you here should be kind of bing, 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 bing. You should be experts at this, content experts. The shoulder weakness. You should be able to differentiate from the neural or the shoulder pathology from brachial plexitis, um, from other causes of something. Don't rely on rehab or sports doctors. You're going to be the competent experts. This is your, your thing. The other thing that was interesting, you guys, after this patient is, you know, they had it was like almost like a um, clipper file. You know, he had a fused thing. So one thing we always do, and I always think it's educational, anyways, is um, you know the post-op CT, and you carefully look at it. Because the radiologist never called the fracture, right. you know, something kind of, we just picked up. Okay. Um, and you can see, I mean, it, it acts like a, almost like an ankylosing spondylitis. You yeah. know, the whole thing was fractured. And his bone was super soft, I and mean, you could just go right through And he's a young kid, too. So we're going to do him today, like C4 to T1. Um, but to me, um, the other thing that was interesting with that is his deltoid weakness was pretty profound immediately after surgery, and then it got better. So, you know, uh, and, and I actually and, recently had my first C5 after injury. Did you have one at, after injury? Yeah, very recently. I had okay. like, um, one of the risk factors that they found in one of the studies was the lift of the decompression and the CT spine. So actually, they said more aggressive flammable decompression in the higher than this. And I think in my case, that could have been it because it's really tight spine, but um, really trying to decompress that, it's almost like a direct nerve injury. Mm -hmm. Whereas in posterior, it's more of an indirect kind of uh, stretch type of injury. Mm -hmm. So, awesome. Great job, Patrick. Thank you. Thanks for, for yeah, listening. Awesome